Boaters, boaters. This is Paulie from All Docked Up. The question is, is how you do it? And, uh, you know, Thursday night, podcast night, we got my main man, Captain Buzz. Never do a podcast without him. Captain Buzz, yo, how, how you doing? I, I'm, the, I'm doing great. It's, it's a good night. We got a lot of great stuff to talk about. And, and I'm particularly excited about the boater spites this evening because you are back in the kitchen. You are back in a professional setting. Tell us about this. I'll tell you what. I got uh, my younger brother got sick. His wife, uh, you know, calls me and says, Paul, your brother's sick. You know, with, with, with the pandemic and everything that's going on in our country, everybody's short staffed. So especially my family's restaurants in Jamison, Doylestown, Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, you know, all completely, you know, understaffed. And I'm like, okay. So I had to go back home. Uh, La Familia and the Italian family, See? La Familia is, is the number one most important thing. And my brother's sick, so I got to go. I'm in Annapolis. I got a phone call. I'm back in PA in three hours sharp. Find out what's going on. And me and my 73-year-old father, Agostino, had to run my younger brother's Willow Grove store with being understaffed by 45%. Look at you. You're, you're back in there. You're you're yeah. tur you're turning yeah. pies. You're working the oh desk. Oh, my God. So taking orders. So I, yeah. So traditionally, when I was out of the restaurant business, you know, officially, we were taking orders on a notepad. We were writing large pepperoni, onions, and sausage on a <laughs> box with a, with a black marker. Now everything's computerized and the POS system. And I got thrown with a brand new POS system. I had 24 hours to figure out how to use are, it. Are we talking point of sale or piece of, sh piece of shit? Well, you know what? That depends on <laughs> what time of the day it is and All how right. I feel. That's fair. Because That's it could fair. be a piece of shit or a point of sale. <laughs> so I'm going into this and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, I get my greasy, dirty detailing clothes on. People are like, look at this kid. And I'm like, That's the only clothes I got. Tell, uh, tell me you had a big old white apron on tied behind you. Oh, I didn't have a white apron <laughs> tied behind me. I had a green apron tied behind me. I looked like a fucked up Christmas tree. <laughs> OK, it was not good. You know, my guts hanging out. I look like a mama fanook over here. I mean, it's not good. Tell me I had, it, had uh, you know, flour and fingerprints on it from making flour. pizzas. I was covered in olive oil, garlic, parsley, flour. <laughs> you name it. I was covered in it. You could have called me Betty Crocker on on crack that night. That's I was covered in crap just because you know, I'm not into the, you know, the daily routine of things. And. It was brutal. It so, was brutal. I know you're working the line. I know you t you had to toss some nice pasta dishes. Uh, your brother's got a nice menu. Well, uh, listen, you know, uh, the, the old traditional, it never fails. The famous chicken parmigiana with a nice spaghetti or penny on the side with a salad and bread. It's a beautiful thing. And it's been a staple that people have been ordering by the thousands upon thousands from the public to all my family stores. It's got all you your order basic food groups. Yeah, you order a chicken parmigiana with a spaghetti, a nice salad with a creamy Italian dressing and garlic knots, you're a fat bastard by the time it's all said and done, okay? You are full, and you have breakfast and lunch the following day. You're going Breco. I'm nice. telling you, it's phenomenal. Nice. And uh, <laughs> I got my absolute ass handed to me. My 73-year-old father is chapping at my neck. Paulie. No, 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 Paul. You got to cut the pie this way, Paul. You got to cut the pie this way. That's never going to change, like, dude. You know it's, it's never going to change. And I almost, I almost had to crack him with a pizza spatula. <laughs> it's Friday night. There's tickets all over the place. Phones ringing off the hook. <laughs> we got to get staff. We got to get your dad out on on the Bay Isle on the 420. I know he wants. A, I know he wants a ride. Yeah. Well, good luck. Is if you, maybe he'll start barking orders at you, the son of a bitch. I'm sure he Old will. Old school, knobbly done. But you know what the thing was. No matter what, at the end of the day, the goal was to deliver the product to the customers at 100%, no matter what was going on. And our family store, and I'm going to do a shout out to, you know, Nino's Pizza Rama, Willow Grove at Blair Mill and 611, my younger brother, Amalia's store, the customers were happy. We, My father kept me on my toes. I'm telling you, it was just like throwing me into the fire. It was... Um, but my dad looked at me, he says, Paulie, Pop, what's up, buddy? I got to say, you still got it. And I'm uh, like, hey, thank that's... God. Like, give me something because I'm ready to sever your head from your shoulders with a pizza spatula at 60 mile an hour. 
from, from Papa Anzalone. That's a big, big statement. It's a big statement. And, um, you know, and I, he's like, bully, we, we got to kick ass. We got to kick ass. And I said, yes, sir. We're going to get it done. We're going to make Amalio proud. So, and we did. Uh, so I'm making pasta dishes, you know, cheesesteak, hoagie, mayo, oil and vinegar, loading it up. I mean, just working the grill, tossing pies. It, it was incredible. And um, I've never been so sore in my entire life. And I detail boats for a living, so I'm not exactly sure how that's possible. But Well, that is one heck of a boater's bites. And and, uh, and hats off to you for going up and helping your family out. And uh, I know you were enjoying it as much as it was a challenge. And, you know, you're back into the restaurant. But uh, you, you, it's it's riding a bike. You didn't forget. And, Pop, and Papa gave you, you know, validation on that. Well, first he gave me a fresh smack over the head with a pizza spatula. Then he gave me validation because there's no validation unless you get a fresh one. It's just the the natural, you know, uh, course of events in an Adego family. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> let's move into. Uh, excuse me, my captain. Let's talk briefing. captains. Yeah, let's talk captains' briefing. Skip, what do you got? Yeah. So it's it's you know I know we've we've talked about you know when folks come on board your boat and <clears throat> and you. Uh, just give them a heads up on where the throw cushion is and where the life jackets are and, and things like that. But you know, uh, you I should, brought a good question to you tonight. Well, you I? should, you, you, you should designate someone as, as your first mate. And, and it, and it, this could be, it could be an, a friend of yours who knows how to run a boat. Um, it could be your spouse if they know how to run the boat, but if the captain or, you know, the, the, you're running the boat and you become incapacitated in some sense. You How know, do you who, stop the boat? Yeah. Who, who's going to take over and, and they need to understand how to general boat, you know, running knowledge on pulling back the throttles and putting the boat in neutral and, or, uh, you know, if they have enough skills Possibly to bring it back shifting in reverse, you know, get, calling a distress on the radio, whatever needs to happen. But, it's important to designate someone as the second in command in the event that the captain becomes incapacitated. So it's, it's an important piece. And I know we had talked about, you know, getting your crew ready to go, but we never said, Hey, who's, who's next, who's next in command. Who's next. Number in line? one, who's next in line and any, and whoever is next in line, the multi-million dollar question is whether you're underway five knots, you're just in gear you know, you're, you're running at idle. Do you know how to physically stop the boat, even with momentum, with wind, with current? Can you physically stop the boat? So, uh, so let, let's talk about that, Captain Buzzy. I mean, on your specific vessel, we're on board. Let's let's do a hypothetical here. We're on board. We're going out. You know, Buzzy. Uh, I don't know. You know, you get vertigo. You hit the floor. You got the spins. You got to need well, whatever your equilibrium's off. Okay. Cause I'm not saying anything extreme because I don't want to see that, but long and short of it, I'm on board the bay out. I'm on board the 420 with twin diesel, straight shafts and rudders. How do I stop the boat? Yeah. You're going to come up to the helm. You know what to do, right? You got to pull back on the throttles before you put it into neutral. And that's essentially stopping the boat. Now you can, now, well, since you, know now it, you got two pairs, you got two pairs, you got two sets there. Okay, you got two sets of handles there. So you got your 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 port and starboard side. You got your throttle and your shifter. You know what side is your throttles on? What side is your shifters on? Well, that's a great point. And uh, you know the the throttles are on the on the outside on the starboard side, and on uh, inside of the steering wheel is the uh, uh, is the shifter. But but you just reminded me of something because if I'm on plane and running at speed. I have my engine synchronizer, and that means one of the throttles is the primary and one is the slave. And if you don't know that and you tr got to pull them back, they're not really going to move until you hit that, turn that synchronizer So let's off. not even go that complicated. Right. On your physical shifters, on your diesels, you have an indicator that will tell somebody whether it's a throttle or a shifter. Correct me if I'm wrong. I do. There's a little sticker on each of the, each of the controllers. Right. So they're either red or black, correct? Well, no, it's just a black sticker. One says throttle and one says shift. Okay, but on the actual handles, on the end of your handles, one has two red dots on the end and the other does not. Yeah, one, well, that's the slave and the, and the, uh, the primary. Um, the primary has a red dot. The slave does not. The shifters okay. don't have any, any 
buttons or, or indicators on them. Right, just on the throttle side. So make sure, guys, you know, every boat's different. Make sure you understand which one, because I've been uh, pulling up to a, a dock with somebody, and Buzzy, you know exactly who I'm talking about, and we were on his houseboat, and he got confused, and he went to throttle up and said he was looking to shift his gears, both of his engines in the forward position, but he maximized his throttles. And then the engines are screaming, and then he went to shift into gear. I thought both transmissions were going to fly out and walk away. Ouch. Yeah. Okay. Because technically speaking, you should never ever shift your 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 gears in and out of gear uh, if you were exceeded a thousand RPMs. Right. Well, it, 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 it's actually eight hundred and below is ideal for proper shifting. Sure. Sure. And if you okay. have a if you have a, a single lever then uh, it's your throttle and your shift. So you can't do that, right? As you're, maybe if you're in reserve. Well, no, because there's a shift, there's a shift interrupter switch on most IOs that when you go to take that from a forward position, pulled it back, you were, you know, you were on top of the water, you were on plane, pulled it back into a neutral position. The shift, in, when you go to shift in a reverse, that shift interrupter switch kick, kicks in, kills the motor for about a second and a half allows the actual boat to shift into a different gear without destroying it or grinding it. But if you are flying and you have a lot of momentum and you're moving real hard, you go to shift that thing in a reverse, you're going to hear some grinding because, you know, you got that forward momentum. So let's move into the detailers briefing. I know you're, you're going to shift a little bit here. Well, you know what? We got to talk detailers briefing and I'll tell you what, um, a lot of my customers that I've taken notice to are making the decision to keep their boats in the water throughout the course of the winter time. Um, instead of pulling the boat out, putting it to bed and getting a shrink wrap, put it on the hard and full winterization, they're leaving the boat in the water. Um, some people are like, you know what, I'm going to leave it in the water and I plan on having my boat covered by a professional shrink wrapper. Uh, as I leave it in the winter over the winter months in my regular slip. And I'll tell you what, I'm all for it. I'm okay with it. I, I don't see a problem with it. But once again, if you make that conscious decision that there's planning involved and in, in physically doing this. So well, a lot of my customers, yeah. go ahead, jump in. What do you got? What well, you got? I, I'm on the fence because I needed to keep the boat in the water a little bit longer this year. I got busy. I haven't gotten a chance. So I'm still in. Uh, and it's, you know, it's getting, uh, mid November. <clears throat> um, and so I'm, I'm on the fence. Okay. Do I, do I continue the winterization project and have it pulled out? Uh, that's kind of where I'm leaning. Uh, but I might be convinced. I don't to leave think it you in. should. And I'll tell you right now. So first of all, if you're going to, you know, if you live in the area where the water, if you live in the area where your boat is actually mourned at a marina that is likely to freeze because you're so close you can check on your boat daily. That's number one. Um, the number two, every single marina, make sure that if you do in-water boat storage, ask them, do they use ice eater pumps, you know, to keep the water around your boat circulating in the event that the temperatures drop below. Perfect example, the bubbler system, okay? The ice eater bubbler systems, there's all different types, uh, uh, you know, and a lot of marinas used to make sure that the, the, the marina doesn't freeze over. But at the end of the day, Make sure they got ice eaters. One of the marinas that I'm currently at has thermostatic, you know, ice eater bubblers at the winter time. Nobody has to turn them on when the temperature drops below a certain degree in the water. They physically turn on, um, and obviously that prevents the ice formations that you know form around the hull that could be damaging to your boat. If you're that close, you live that close to your boat, you want to leave it in the water. No big deal. Make sure, like I said, make sure you stop by on a daily basis. Um, Another thing is during the actual, you know, winter months, uh, some of the times the problem is, is that we have really strong, bad storms. Um, and you got to make sure that extra you're, lines and extra fenders, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely want to make sure that you do that. Uh, you know, especially on the Chesapeake Bay, you know, uh, our winter boating on the Chesapeake Bay is very similar to the Pacific Northwest. And like I said, a lot of advantages, a lot of disadvantages. The weather's always the disadvantage, but storms are more frequent and fierce. So we got to make sure that we got extra lines on board, extra bumpers. You're tied forward and aft. Your spring lines are in place. 
that boat is good to go in the in the event that a storm does brew up in the winter time. Um, and it doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, winterizing the boat. I, I always encourage winterizing the boat because God forbid something goes wrong, you're not there. Have I winterized my boat completely being in the water over winter months? No, sir, I have not. But I was a live aboard at that stage of the game. So you had you had heaters? I had heaters. So technically speaking, I have gas engines. So you should never have any type of spark in your engine room at any one given point in time. Okay. Um, make sure that you buy a, a heater for your engine that is completely certified and compliant and spark free to be able to keep that engine room. And they only turn on if the temperature drops below, you know, 34 degrees, 32 degrees, between 32 and 55. There's all different types of ones out there. But if you want to keep your boat in the water, investing in a bilge heater is never a bad way to go. Spark free, very safe, specifically built for that application. Check out your local boat store to find it. You know, number two, winterize the actual water system. Go for the gold. Got to do that. You do use, if you do use the toilet, make sure you have antifreeze in your fresh water tank, which you would anyway. So if you do prime your system with a vacuum flush and you go to flush, you're flushing antifreeze. You're not flushing water. All systems are completely in operation and you're flushing with antifreeze. Um I see a lot of boaters, uh, you know, my East Coast sales director, her main fresh water tank is underneath her forward, uh, you know, in her forward stateroom under the bow bed, but she's going to keep the boat in the water all winter long. And the boat's professionally heated um, with an actual Dometic inline electric furnace instead of having using the heat pump, which unfortunately stops working when the water temperature drops below 41 degrees. Um, so she's set to go. So technically she could leave her tank fresh and full. But if she's also spending a lot of time on it, if you're not going to do that, the holding, look yeah, at the that. holding tank, right? You don't want to put, you know, it, maybe the fresh water is fine, but you don't want to flush with fresh water because then the holding tank could freeze. You would never want to, that's what I'm saying. When, when the boat, if you fresh, if you winterize your, you know, gray water tank, um, along with your fresh water system, even your black water. But no, once again, if you're going to leave your boat in the winter, you do not leave a fresh water tank. You must pump it out before the cold winter, you know, the cold takes place. You got to start off with a completely dry tank. And then if you are flushing and your boat uses fresh water flush, then it's actually going to be flushing antifreeze and you're good to go. But, um, you know, make sure that you have that set into place. So if you decide to do it, I have a lot of boaters that are actually paying guys to shrink wrap the boat right into water. Mm -hmm. um, and you can get clear shrink wrap, everybody. Turn your boat into a greenhouse. <laughs> yeah. And it's nice. And I, Buzzy, I did it. You've seen me do it in the past. I have. Um, I have, yeah. So, I mean, you, I do believe you do it, but make sure you're cautious. You take the necessary steps and you make sure you do it the right way and check with your insurance company to let them know that if you are doing in-water winter storage, that you have a rider or they know that that boat is in the water to make sure that your pre-existing coverage that's proprietary on your policy will cover you for in-water storage. Everybody, don't forget to check that. Well, look, let's. Um, we got a couple different topics to talk about. Yeah, what else are we talking about there, Buzzy? Yeah. I, I need a cocktail. I ain't got no ice on board. <laughs> oh, I'm no. traveling all over. The, no, I got no ice. I can't make a cocktail. Tell, I'm going dry tonight. Tell me you got coffee to, for tomorrow morning. No, I don't even have coffee, you son of a bitch. I got to wake up tomorrow morning. I got to go get coffee. Get or I'm going to go the back. F out of here. I know. I got to get out of here because I think I'm just going to go back out. I got water. I got no cafe. I got no creamer. I got no sugar. If I don't have coffee in the morning, uh, everybody better watch out. Yeah, dude. There's one thing about winterizing your boat and getting it ready, but you better have coffee on board. Yeah, if you have a winterized boat and you have a fresh cup of joe in the morning, <laughs> life is okay. So I want to <laughs> get into a topic that um, it's in it and it's it's similar to like a good Samaritan rule, but it it's on the water and it's so I haven't heard that in a long time. Right? Should you? render assistance or, or are you required? And so I'm going to read, uh, from, from, from the coast guard. So I found a document. So a master or individual in charge of a vessel shall render assistance to any 
individual found at sea in danger of being lost. So far as the master or individual in charge can do so without serious danger to the master's or individual's vessel or individuals on board. So obviously there's different circumstances, um, but you know, if you can render aid again, based on that criteria and you're not putting your, yourself or your crew in danger, you should render aid. And if, if something were to, I don't know, happen to the person you're trying to render aid to, um, you're, you're, you're not responsible again, like a good Samaritan law, you, you, you should, you should, or you must render aid to someone who's, who could be lost at sea. So it's, that's it's, the boaters code. Of hand, that's the boaters code. It's, it's interesting. Another boater yeah. is in, 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 in trouble. You go help that fellow boater. It's the boaters, you know, moral code. <laughs> That's like the Hippocratic Oath for boaters. You got to do that. And it, and it goes further to talk about, uh, you know, the statute is to render reasonable assistance, right? You're not jumping in the water. You're not, you're not again, putting yourself in danger. But if there's a, uh, you know, if, if the weather, maybe a storm's coming in and, and you see a boat floundering and they're waving their arms, yeah, you got to go over and help them. And if, and if at all possible and you can tow them, with, out of danger without doing damage and or putting your crew and yourself at risk, you know, do so. So it's important. It's an important piece. Uh, it's important to understand. And that, you know, again, you're, you're safe from liability if you render aid or when you render aid and, and something were to go wrong. So it's an important piece for folks and boaters to understand. Yes. And I agree. Um, don't put yourself, if you are a novice and experienced boater, do not put yourself and your crew in harm's way if you know or if if you really don't have an idea um, and you can't safely help, you could very easily put yourself in a life and death situation. So make sure you understand that. Don't, uh, I guess uh, I've heard it a lot of times, you know, you want to play hero, but don't be a hero. Well, don't, yeah, don't, yes, don't put anyone else. You know, you, you got to make sure that you're safely going to be able to help these individuals. Um, and be able to keep yourself and your crew safe at all times while rendering any type of assistance to another boater. I like it. So the the next topic I want to talk about, and this we're digging deep into the archives on some of this stuff, but I find it amazing and really interesting. So so think about this, right? You know, the hull identification number on your boat. And we kind of all know that the last couple digits are when the boat was manufactured. But what does that actually mean? Yeah, you actually brought something really cool to my attention tonight, Cap. I, I love it. Um, it I think a lot of people are going to love to hear this. So, so if your boat, say they started to build your boat in February of 2021 this year, right? If they finished it, by um, uh, May, or they finished, I'm sorry, if they finished it by June 1st, then it's still a 2021 model year, right? Um, and But if it's, if it's finished after June 1st of 2021, then it becomes a 2022 model year, and that's what will go on the hull. Now, well, that I'll, is that is very very cool. So, just when you're looking at like I know my boat when I when I uh, it's, it's it's an 04, but it was manufactured later in the year. And when I went to you know register the boat with with Sea Ray and talk to them, they said, "Oh, you have a you have a, a later you know a later in the year." And I said, "Oh, it's not an 05. No, no, that made a change. So it's interesting. So think about that uh, when you're looking at a hull identification number. Uh, as to when it may or may not have been, and it's the key is when it was completed, when the manufacturing was completed. That's very cool. Isn't that cool? I like it. Very, very cool. That's I had no idea about that at all. So here's here's another that I found uh, another tidbit that I found really, and this is going way deep into the into the stuff. But and I don't know that anyone would ever do this, but think about think about a cap size, right? And this is this is rare, right? Right, but. You and I talk about things that, hey, let's get ready. But if your boat capsizes and you have black bottom paint and it's getting dark, 
it's going to be really difficult for rescuers. It's going to be really hard for the Coast Guard it. to recognize you, or because it'll blend so easily. Exactly. Or if it's a if you don't have bottom pain and say it's a white hull and conditions are, you know, bad, it, the white hull could almost look like a white cap, and it'll blend in as well. And I said, this is fascinating. So what they recommend, and again, I have never even heard of this. I've never even seen it. I've never even heard of anybody talking about it. That's why you and I do these podcasts, because we bring this stuff, this cool stuff up, right? Uh, Is to paint, use tape, fluorescent tape on the bottom of your boat or fluorescent paint on the bottom of your boat. And and I'm thinking to myself, well, okay, (laughs) if you're in the Chesapeake Bay or you're in salt water, and maybe your boat sits in the slip for a while, you're going to have growth on the tape and or that paint, and it may not become visible later in the season if you happen to capsize. At least it's better than nothing. But, you know, think about that. I mean, who who would ever do that? I never even thought about, well, let's, you know, go into the marine and saying, are you going to bottom paint me? Yeah, let's put an orange strip right down the keel. So in case I <laughs> capsize, they'll be able to find me. Crazy stuff. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> I will tell you what, I have never thought about it. It did not cross my mind, but, um, I hear, you know, uh, uh stuff come out of it, um, uh, out of the coast guard, you know, capside vessel in the Patapsco. I've heard capside. I, I've heard the calls come out from the United States coast guard. You know, if anyone's in the area to render aid, um, uh, you know, to observe and report, um, but I never would have thought about that in a million years. So you learn some, that's what I love about boating. You never, ever, ever stop learning. That is true. That is true. You never stop, but uh, you just never stop learning. And that's, <laughs> and that's wonderful. That I find it. I just find that fascinating, uh, that, that you would even think about doing that. So I have one more thing to talk about and that's, um, and this is again, going deep, right? So You may have come across a situation where you have a boat and you think it's a defect. So is it a defective boat? Is something wrong with this boat? And there is actually a vehicle, and I say vehicle, it's a form to fill out if you think there's something wrong with your boat, but it it has specific criteria. So let me read this. So the hazard must occur virtually without warning. An obvious risk or normal wear and tear does not normally create the basis for the defect, right? So it's got to be something that, whoa, all of a sudden something happened, right? Think about that. Second, the defect must occur with some frequency. One isolated occurrence doesn't necessarily constitute the basis of finding a defect. When I talk about defect, I'm not talking about you know, my engine isn't running right. I'm talking about something that is um, substantial risk to personal injury or public safety kind of defect. And then number three is the defect must clearly present the risk of death or serious injury. And so these criteria are not absolute and they provide a framework, but there is a form uh, for the Coast Guard and it's called the Boat Owner's Report of possible safety defect. Again, no idea that this existed, but for someone who has a boat that, wow, this is a really serious flaw in the design and or it poses the type of risks that I just covered, there is a form to fill out and the Coast Guard will take that and inspect the boat, the boat and look for, you know, if, if this warrants a defect to go back to the manufacturer and uh, and have them repair it and or fix their design for future boats. Isn't that amazing? I find that amazing. Yeah, that is very cool. <laughs> very cool. It's amazing how deep, you know, you are able to get if you really do your homework. That's cool to be a boat nerd. And you and I are both boat nerds. That's the way it is. We're, that's the way it is. That's what we're here to do. It is what it is. I, <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. We got to find out the stuff that, uh, you know, people are unaware of. There's That's just the bottom line. Yes, yes. It's, that is just the bottom line. And as you said, it, it's it's a learning experience. And and again, I, I, I find this stuff fascinating. I hope our listeners find this fascinating. And I hope that everyone who listens to us will download the All Docked Up app 
and or get their podcasts from there and get their boating services and look at the events coming up and look at all the boaters tools and use the app and rate the app. And, and so we can continue to provide content, uh, but we need, we need folks to uh, jump on board the app and use it um, uh, to make their boating experience better. I agree. I'll tell you what, in the next uh, boat show coming up, Chesapeake Bay Boat Show at the Timonian Fairgrounds, uh, we're going to be there. And the Baltimore show, Buzzy, um, they are still trying to come up with a tentative date for the boat show. The uh, the Baltimore boat show at the Baltimore Convention Center is we still do not have an effective date. Um, the Timonian show, I'm sorry, the Chesapeake Bay boat show at Timonian Fairgrounds conflicted with that same date on the same day. And I haven't gotten an update, but we will be there and... Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I love the boat shows. I love talking to boaters. We had an Annapolis power boat show and sailboat show buzzy. Was that awesome or what? It, it really was. And, uh, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to the next boat show to talk about, um, so, and some pass out some t-shirts that have you and I on them in our caricatures and, you know, all things boating. With that Paulie does and not Captain compliment Buzz. me all that well. <laughs> <laughs> they do not compliment me all that well. Well, listen, I believe I was. We have uh, on that one. We have um, we have burned another thirty minutes again. Uh, th- this is okay. Captain Buzz from All Docked Up, standing by on six eight. Everybody, this is Paulie from All Docked Up, standing by on six eight. Everybody, have a great night and thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>